Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Yeah, this is the 11 o'clock, so we should have enough coffee in our system, right? Hey, well, I surely do, so please forgive me if I get a little too excited up here. But my name is Colin. I'm the hospitality pastor and uh, Team WC, also known as a volunteer pastor. And I just want to welcome you here. And if you're joining us online, I welcome you as well. We're so grateful you're joining us. And hey, I just want to... Um, Maybe take a minute uh, as people are getting settled in here. I just want to take a minute and encourage us, maybe slash challenge us um, to think through some things. And so if you uh, came through our west side of the building, you might have noticed uh, a, construction, a construction zone and a lot of dirt and a lot of rubble and a lot of stones uh, out in the front. And so you may see this dirt and this rubble. However, what we see is an expanded kids ministry. We see an expanded building for our kids. Isn't that exciting? Is anyone excited about that? Come on. Listen, this is the next generation of our church. This is the next generation of our community. This is the next generation that we're gonna rise up and see future educators, future doctors, future first responders, future politicians in the name of Jesus. And so we have an opportunity as a local church to not allow this to become a spectator sport. We don't want Sunday mornings just to become this cl like clockwork and we're not doing anything during the week. And so if I can encourage you this morning, we want to be the local church and influence this next generation. It is crazy exciting to see that we're actually blowing out classrooms and that these little ones are getting, hearing about Jesus and hearing the truth when they could be learning and hearing other things from other outside influences. But here today and every Sunday, week in and week out, we have an opportunity to bring life, encouragement and spur those little ones on, amen? And so listen, as I was saying, Church is not meant to be a spectator sport. Pastor Matt uh, was sharing with us out of Matthew 25 a few weeks ago. And he was mentioning about how Jesus was talking to the disciples and he was saying like, hey, I'm calling you to feed the hungry, to show hospitality to the stranger, to clothe the naked, to visit the prisoners. That is not just a to-do list. Pastor Matt was sharing that, that is a symptom. If we believe in Jesus, love Jesus, and devote our lives to Jesus, that should not just be a to-do list, but that is where we are compelled from our innermost being to be a voice, to be, to influence and to influence those around us. And so I'm challenging our church this morning. Hey, we're going to go deep. We're going to dive in. We're going to worship. We're going to hear a word, but don't let this just be a Sunday. Don't let this just be the exercise going week in and week out, but maybe get activated. Maybe God's calling you to do something. Join a group, join biblical community, get involved. There are, believe it or not, we're a big church, but we have needs. And there are plenty of opportunities to start serving. God might be calling your name to get involved. Many of you, I'm sure you're involved in your businesses and other outside areas, but maybe there's something to do here. And so I just wanna challenge you and encourage you, ask God what that might look like, amen? All right, well, speaking of uh, church community, let's go ahead and celebrate our new members by uh, watching our screens. So good to worship together and good to cheer on people that are becoming part of the church. Uh, so good to see all of you this morning. Um, seems like there was something I was supposed to do. Oh yeah, I want you guys to stand up and shake everybody's hand around you that you want to. Say hello, greet those around you. <laughs> wow, that was a good one. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> Yes, you know that it, 
that it is good to have fun in church, right? You know, and yet there's times when it gets very serious in church because God does business with us. And, uh, but we can enjoy our time together. It's, it's wonderful. I have a scripture to share with you this morning as we prepare to worship. It's from Luke 18. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, O God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else, for I don't cheat, I don't sin, and I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. This is all good stuff, right? Except for the judgment part, right? Well, look at, look at verse 13. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, oh God, be merciful to me for I'm a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you this sinner not the Pharisee returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We're gonna be talking about crossroads this morning. We're in a series about crossroads and those, those crucial moments in our lives where we have a decision to make, where we can choose to go one way or another way. And it's gonna affect the direction of our life. Sometimes they're big crossroads, sometimes they're small ones. These two guys, we're facing what I call the crossroad of humility because they both went to the temple, a good thing. They both came to pray, but the posture of their heart was so contrasting. You see, the Pharisee came with confidence in who he was. In fact, he really wasn't praying. He was just like bragging up himself, right? And uh, he was concerned about looking good on the outside and judging those around him because they weren't as good as him. The tax collector, on the other hand, that was from one of the most despised occupations. And he came and he said, Lord, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. He threw himself on the mercy of God. The Pharisee was just bragging up on the merits. And the Pharisee did not go home justified. But the tax collector, thank God, he ran into the mercy of God. He repented and was forgiven. And so I just want to call us this morning as we're entering into time of worship to like take a moment to check the posture of our heart. I've found sometimes as, you, as you're a Christian longer and longer, it's easy to kind of slip into that judgment mode or looking at other people around or thanking God we're not like that person or as a church thanking God we're not like some other church. I'll tell you what guys, the posture of the heart that God's looking for is humility. And the good news is God's mercy awaits those who have humble hearts. And so let's just take a moment to pray and bring our posture to God in that way. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you how you met this tax collector. And God, I thank you that no matter where we are today, whether we are far from you, whether we've maybe messed up majorly last night, or maybe we've been believers for a long time, God, there was mercy awaiting that Pharisee if he would have humbled himself, just like there was mercy for the sinner. And God, there's something in all of us, God, today as we come that we just wanna lay it before your feet and say, God, we wanna meet with you. And so we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. The wages of my sin was dead.
Jesus, he won't, not for a minute, not for an hour. Oh, he won't. Come on, let's just sing that. Oh, Jesus, he won't. You are faithful, you're faithful, he won't. Oh, no, he won't. Not our family, not our kids, you are faithful. Oh, the gates of hell will not prevail. more than anything. 
Your breath. 
Use your breath. He's your breath. And I am. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. It's your breath. And I am. So we pour out our praise to you. Man, isn't that fun? <laughs> That's awesome, man. Oh my, it's so much fun to worship God. God, you're amazing. We worship you. So holy. Yet so present. God, we can't even wrap our minds around that. But you're here, you're right here. And you're in heaven. Oh, God, we love you. We love you. God, we also know that you are present in the brokenness that we live in in this world. God, you're present in our, our pain and our stuff. God, as a church family, we experience those things. You said to rejoice with those that rejoice, weep with those that weep. God, I thank you that we can gather around and do that this morning. I'm gonna pray for a couple of families here. Uh, Matt and Anna Newswang, if you guys could come to the front, any family members that are with, with you could come. We're also gonna be praying for Ruth Eckert. Ruth lost her daughter. Ruth is 94 year old saint, been part of Worship Center for a long time. And uh, she lost her daughter, it was 68. So we're gonna pray for her, uh, she's watching online. Matt and Anna, um, they lost their little girl, Sarah Joy stillborn at 39 weeks. And uh, just want to stand with them, guys. Send our love to them as we pray. God, we trust you, and we know that you're the rock on which we stand. God, when we go through times like this, of, on our side of heaven seems like such a loss, Lord. We pray for Matt and Anna, God, I thank you that they love you. And God, that you've been showing up big in their lives in these last week and a half, Lord, since this has happened. God, I just pray your continued arms underneath them and holding them, God, as they go through times of grief and God, this life-altering moment in time. And God, we just thank you too that Sarah Joy, is with you. We pray you would continue to just bring your spirit's comfort and all that's needed for Matt and Anna, for the rest of the family, Lord, for her mom and sister and others in the family and for friends, Lord Jesus. We're so grateful. Lord, the very God that we're worshiping here, Lord, is the, the presence of God is where Sarah Joy is right now. God, help us Help us to keep our hearts turned toward you and, and know that life here is short. But God, sometimes life here really hurts. So we thank you that you are near to the brokenhearted. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray too for Ruth, Lord. I, I thank you for this dear saint, Lord. And we pray for her as she's lost her daughter, Lord Jesus. Lord, on the, on the way we look at it, Lord, it seems like a parent should never have to bury their child no matter what age. And so God, we pray comfort for Ruth too. And, your precious, precious Holy Spirit's presence in your wonderful name, Lord. Amen. 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 All right, guys, that's what church is. Standing with people, loving God, rejoicing with people. So you can go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> Did want to take a little bit of time to pray for um, other, other needs that are going on here in our world. So if you could join me in that. Father, I thank you that we can look to you for your direction, your Holy Spirit's power in our lives. God, we pray for others in our church who may be uh, suffering in some way. God, we pray for the community, Lord, uh, where we live. Lord, I pray for others who may be hurting. Lord, I'm thinking of the uh, Amanda Hufford family, Lord, um, 
may you just minister life there, God, in ways uh, and comfort. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would bring believers around them, people that encourage them. Lord, I pray for all those, Lord Jesus, uh, that are going through a difficult time right now. I thank you, Lord, that we can trust you. Lord, we do pray over this nation, Lord. I'm reminded of your scripture that says when we, as your people, humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, God, that you would heal from heaven and heal our land. God, we pray that. We speak that over our nation. We speak that over our leaders, Lord God. We pray for them, lift them up to you, God. And Lord, we pray too for the stirring that's going on in our nation, Lord God. God, when all things around us are shaking, just like we sang this morning, we know that you are the only solid ground. So I pray that people's lives would be turned toward you, God. May we recognize that anything else is too empty. Anything else, Lord, is, is not going to last. But Lord, may we look to you and God, we just pray for your Holy Spirit's guidance, for your precious presence in our lives, in Jesus' name. And everybody together said, amen, amen. Amen. So I'm gonna pick up reading in Luke 18, and this is just a a few passages down from where we read about the tax collector and the Pharisee uh, when they were at their crossroad of humility. So starting in verse 18, and now a certain ruler asked him, saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but no one is good, but one that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing, sell all that you have, distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, well, who then can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, see, I have left all and followed you. So he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come, eternal life. Father, I thank you for your word. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are like water to our souls. You'll help us interpret the word today. And God, I thank you that your word gives light to our path. Amen. Amen. Crossroad. Crossroad. We're talking about crossroads, those places in our lives where we have a choice to make. And depending on which way we turn will affect the direction of our life and the rest of our life. And so we're looking right now at this, what we call the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler. And he's facing a crossroad of what I would call of surrender. He's faced with deciding which direction his life's going to go. Now, we don't know a lot about this man. Uh, We know uh, the Bible says he was very rich. It says he was a ruler. So uh, that tells me he was in some kind of leadership role. The Bible doesn't say what. Maybe he was a community leader or a business leader. And most scholars think he was young because of the way he answered. So that's why we call him the rich young ruler. We also know he was a good man. He kept the commandments. But I think the most important thing about him was that he was searching for something more. He was searching for something more. You know, as a good Jewish man, he would have been at what everyone else would have thought was the pinnacle of having assurance that he had eternal life because he knew the commandments and he not only knew them, it says he kept the commandments. Uh, He was very wealthy in that culture. Uh, Wealth was looked at as a blessing from God. And yet, he was searching. He asked Jesus, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Do you notice the difference between him and the Pharisee that went to pray at the temple? That guy, he was simply caught up in himself and his own righteousness and had no need of anything else. And this young man must have heard about Jesus and something was stirring in his heart. 
and he wanted more. So when Jesus asked him about the commandments, he was quick to respond. He said, oh, I've kept all those since my youth. Now, if he would have truly been following Jesus and listening to Jesus, he would have heard Jesus say previously about raising the bar on the commandments. Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, man, if you so much as hate your brother, you've committed murder. He said, if you've so much as lusted in your heart, you've committed adultery. Jesus set the bar so high that no one could stand there and say, oh, I've kept all those commandments from my youth. But Jesus just kind of overlooked that, didn't address him on that. He went right to what the real issue was. We pick that up in verse 22. When Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Could we all say one thing? He said, you lack one thing. Did God ever put his finger on something in your life? I love when he do that, does that, and I don't like it when he does it either, if I'm real honest, right? But that's what Jesus did. He said, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. In Mark's version of this, over in Mark 10, Mark says it like this. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. I love how Mark inserted that into this narrative. Right before Jesus put his finger on his one thing, it says he loved him. I think Jesus was connecting with that searching that was going on in his heart. And he said, one thing you lack, go sell what you have. He loved this man. He loved this man. He could see his sincerity. Jesus met the rich young ruler. He met him at the crossroad of surrender. The crossroad of surrender. There's a choice before this young man. Just like he will meet you at every crossroad of surrender that you'll face in your life. I don't know about you, but I've faced a number of those. Sometimes they're little ones, sometimes they're large ones. The rich young ruler had this one thing. Just like him, God will meet us there. You see, when we're searching for more, Jesus will meet us right there. For the rich young ruler, his one thing was his wealth. The Bible says he was very wealthy. It was his possessions. You see, the problem was that God is not the center of his life. God is not the center of his life. His riches were. It kept him from Jesus' promise, which said, hey, you're gonna have treasures in heaven. You're gonna get to follow me. That invitation was out there, but he walked away sorrowful. Jesus went on then to address how riches can make it very hard for a person to enter into the kingdom of God. He said it's like uh, a, you know, a camel going through the eye of a needle, which is an impossibility. And Jesus began to address this. But the important thing is that Jesus was gone after his heart. You know, some people have looked at this story and this passage, and they've come to the conclusion that, well, we have to sell everything we have when we come to Jesus. Like that's a universal thing. Or like poverty is the ultimate. And that's not what Jesus was saying because you can look throughout scriptures, other encounters he had. This is the only time he ever asked someone to do that because he was going after his heart. But Jesus was addressing something that is a temptation to most of us. And that is that pool of money on our heart. Many warnings throughout scriptures about how money can capture our hearts. Here's a couple of them. First Timothy 6.10 says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money, that craving for money. This is not necessarily addressing whether we have a lot of money or no money. It's talking about the craving of the heart. And there's something about money, if we're honest about it, I think for any of us, it has this ability to wrap itself around our heart. And he says, it will lead us to piercing ourselves through with many sorrows. He goes on a few verses later and actually addresses those that are rich in this world. Verse 17, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Well, that's certainly true, isn't it? All we have to do is look around at shaking economy around the world and Money is unreliable, it says. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all that we need for enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, 
always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. You see, craving money leads to all kinds of evil. But doing good with our money leads to treasure in heaven. That's what he was promising. Jesus was promising the rich young ruler, treasure in heaven. He was promising that to these rich people that, uh, that were being addressed here. And you know, by the way, I found it's always easy to think of somebody else as rich, right? Somebody that makes more money and has more stuff than we do. But perspective is important. If we look at where most of us as Americans are compared to the rest of the world, we mostly all could fit in this address that Timothy, uh, Paul was saying through Timothy about addressing the heart and calling us to do good with money. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So important that we pay attention to what we treasure because our hearts are drawn toward what we treasure. That's why he tells us to lay up treasures in heaven. So let's go back to the rich young ruler story. When Jesus is saying, so it's impossible for a rich person to be saved. It's more impossible for a rich person to be saved than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Jesus used this hyperbole to make it clear that without God, it's impossible to be saved. Like there's no amount of human effort, no amount of struggle, no amount of wealth, no amount of doing good works, no amount of anything that can lead a person to eternal life with Christ. But I love what he answered when Peter cried out or the disciples cried out, who then could be saved? Like they couldn't understand this. And he said in verse 27, the things which are impossible for men are possible with God. Are you glad that it's possible with God for any of us to be saved? I am so, yes, let's just, let's just, yes. We can be saved through Christ alone. We sang about that earlier, Christ and Christ crucified. Nothing else can earn our way into salvation. It's a free gift from Jesus Christ on the cross. Then Peter just blurted out. He says, well, see, we have left all to follow you. So he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. Now, these words of Jesus are a bit hard to understand because it sounds like he's saying, man, you leave, leave your home, you're gonna get a whole bunch more homes back. In fact, in Matthew and Mark, where this same to story is told, it says a hundred times, a hundred times. So anybody want a hundred wives? I'm just saying, if Jesus is making that a promise. <laughs> but you know what I think the whole point is? He's looking and calling us, as he was this rich young ruler, to surrender our lives to him and realize the riches that come from that are way more than anything right here today. I know he certainly was not stating a formula on how to get more homes, lands, wives, or children but he was calling us to surrender. Like he said to the rich young ruler, you're gonna have treasure in heaven. Treasure in heaven. Our theme scripture for this series on Crossroads is from Matthew 10 and it says, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. That's the words of Jesus. You know, much like the rich young ruler faced this crossroad of surrender, we all face crossroads of surrender in our lives from time to time. Certainly when we first come to Christ, there's a surrender of saying, God, I trust you for my salvation and I repent of my sin. And I found all along my life, there's been these other junctures where I could choose one way or the other way, sometimes big, sometimes small. And what I found is Jesus will always meet you at that place of surrender if we're open to him. A large crossroad of surrender came uh, to me in 1976. Uh, I was in my early 20s, and I was a dairy farmer. Doris and I were married at that time. I was a dairy farmer. So I guess you could have called me the poor young farmer, all right? 
uh, instead of the rich young ruler, uh, because the 70s weren't very, very uh, kind to dairy farmers, all right? And so I was a Christian, loved God, grew up in a Mennonite church, and, um, but I had this like gnawing inside, like hunger for more, and some of our friends were starting to talk about Jesus in a way that seemed like they knew him better than what we did or something. They were saying, praise God a lot. And they were going to these meetings where they were worshiping. You know, I see Pastor Sam down there laughing. You, you've experienced that too. And they began to tell us about like how the Holy Spirit wanted to be a more active part of our life, how he wanted to fill us. So we began to read some books and search the scriptures and this hunger kept growing. And so there was this charismatic movement among uh, Mennonite young people uh, was happening at that time. And there were some meetings uh, that they invited us to go, go with them to. And by the way, a little side journey here. Um, I don't know if you have seen the movie, The Jesus Revolution, but I highly recommend it if you've not yet seen it because it'll touch you no matter what uh, age you are. Um, it's, a, it's a reminder to me of the faithfulness of God. And, um, and it's also like so timely for what God's doing in our nation today. So that happened in the late 60s, like 69 to early 70s. It took about five years for it to get to the Mennonite hippies here on the East Coast, but, <laughs> which I was kind of one of those. Uh, I always wanted my hair to go down the back of my neck like a true hippie, but mine just curls up and bunches up right in here. <laughs> and that always bugged me. So we went with, we went with our friends to this uh, Holy Spirit conference, it was called. And each night they gave people opportunity to surrender their lives more fully to the Lord and the work of the Spirit in their life. And we resisted the first two nights and there was one more night left. And so that day I was like wrestling and that afternoon I went up into my hay mow in my barn, that's where you stack the hay. And I went up there, I just kind of needed to do some wrestling with God and I was saying, God, you know, I really want to do this but something's holding me back. And just like that, he put his finger on it. He said, you're afraid if you do that, you're gonna to have to give up the farm. Like, that was right. That was absolutely right. Because see, I thought if I fully yield myself to Christ, he's gonna send me to Timbuktu or somewhere. <laughs> I always wonder where that was. Someone after first service came up and showed me where it is. It's some place in Northern France or something. <laughs> I don't know why it's always Timbuktu you think God's gonna send you to, but. And, and I had this feeling like I, it might mean that I'd have to move off the farm. And for us, the farm wasn't just anything. I was the fifth generation of my family to own that farm and farm it. It's one of the most beautiful and most photographed farms in Lancaster County. And we pictured ourselves farming for the rest of our lives and turning it over to our son, Matt. And sixth generation would have been on the farm. See that. <laughs> I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> we were at a crossroad. <laughs> oh. Glad we went the right way. <laughs> but the good news is God meets us right where we are in the crossroads of our life. That afternoon, I came to the place where I said, God, I don't care what I have to give up. I don't care where you call me. I just want whatever's stirring in here. I want more of you, Lord Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 10 years later, uh, we were able to release the farm to a beautiful young Amish couple. And... Uh, and, but by that time, our desires had so changed, it was like, it was, it was an easy thing, you know? When we surrender our lives to God, he shows up in ways we can't even imagine. You know, but that decision, that day changed the course of our lives, changed the course of our kids' lives, our grandkids. You may be at a crossroad of surrender. It might not be that big or dramatic, but the little ones actually can make a huge difference as well. So just like Jesus called out the rich young ruler on that one thing, what one thing might God be asking of you to surrender? What is keeping Jesus from being the center of your life? Again, it could be big, it could be small. It could be like the rich young ruler, it could be possessions could even be something good. Could be, you know, family or sports or your image. Could be an idol, could be a habit. Could be sin. Could be that just desire to control. Whatever it may be. Could be people pleasing. 
Would you invite Jesus to put his finger on that? If you have a, any kind of a stirring going on in your heart toward, toward him, I want to just invite you to do that. We're going to just take some time and ask him to do that. You know, we're at this crossroad of surrender. The awesome thing is that he meets us here. He meets us with mercy, just like he met that tax collector that day. So the band's just gonna continue to play softly, and I just wanna encourage you to take some time right now, and if you need to wrestle with God, wrestle with God. Just be in his presence, ask him. Some of you may already know what it is, but that's okay. Let's take this time, just let God speak to us. Lord, I thank you that you're meeting us right where we are. God, I thank you for every person here today. God, no matter how long we've been a Christian, no matter what we've done, God, you're meeting us. You're meeting us. God, I pray that you would give us the courage to surrender, to place you at the center. worship team's going to start singing Jesus at the center of it all. And I want to encourage you, if you have something that God is specifically showing you to surrender, the altar here is open, the floor is open. Uh, I want to invite you to just come to the front and kneel down, sometimes taking a physical step. Sometimes taking a physical step can make, make a marker. And so as we worship, I just want to invite you, if you'd like to respond, Feel free, because he's gonna meet us right here at the place of surrender. He's gonna meet you in your seat. He's gonna meet you at home tomorrow. So you give your heart to him, making him the center. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. Getting to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus at the center of it all, Jesus at the center of it all. to the end it will always be it's always been you Jesus Jesus nothing else matters nothing in this world will do Jesus your Jesus, you're the same. 
the center of it all. Jesus be the center of my life. Jesus be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, you're the center. Oh, everything revolves around you. Oh, Jesus, you and nothing else matters. Oh, nothing in this world is gonna do. You're the center Everything revolves around you Jesus, you From our heart to the head Jesus, be the center It's all about you Yes, it's all about you Oh,
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, surrender hurts, but surrender is good. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, there may be some of you here today that have never given your life to Christ, like taking that first step. I just want to not close this service until I ask you, whether you're watching online, you're right here in the building. And it is so worth it. Just like that rich young ruler was faced with, come follow me. Jesus is saying to you, come follow me. I want to lead you in a prayer to yield to what's going on in your heart right now, to commit your life to Christ. I'll lead you in a prayer. And if you would repeat after me, and I'll ask everyone to just join in and say, Heavenly Father, I need Jesus. I believe he's the son of God. I believe he died on the cross for me and rose up from the dead for me so that I could have new life. I repent of my old life. I say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I receive you, Jesus. Amen and amen, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer to receive Christ or to come back to him, would you just put your hand up in the air really high right now? We wanna rejoice with you. Yes, I see some hands. Would you just keep your hand up really high? Yes, thank you, Lord. Best decision you ever make. Yes, if you, would just, if you would just keep your hand up or put it back up again because our ushers have, some, have a, a Bible, a box, uh, some information they'd love to get to you just to help you take this step to grow in faith. And um, after the service, I just invite you, if you received the box, to stop back at our connections rooms. There's one on either side of the auditorium. We'd love to just pray with you, find out a little bit more about where you are in your journey so we can help you. Well, I'm so glad you came today, and I'm glad that God showed up here among us, and he's going to continue to work in our lives this week. If you're new to Worship Center, stop by our Connections Room as well. There's ways that you can get connected here. We'd love to find out who you are and welcome you to Worship Center. Um, if you would like to give, uh, we can do that. Regularly, we give here at Worship Center what the Bible calls our tithes and offerings. It's part of giving our treasure to God. You can see on the screen how you can do that. On your way out, there are also boxes here in the house if you wanna drop some uh, money, a check, or cash into that. It's a way to have our treasure uh, doing work in the kingdom of God. If you've got a prayer need, there'll be a prayer team down here before you leave to go. Come on, come on down, and we'd love to pray for you. I think that's it. See you guys. Have a really good week.